Automobiles are one of the leading causes of death for young people in the United States. For every million inhabitants, 12.9 will die in a motor accident. Every day that you get behind the wheel of your car, there's a non-zero chance that you will never leave it alive. While you may be aware of the risk, how does it compare to other countries? Oh. Looking back at the graph, we can see that compared to other developed countries, the United States' death rate is truly staggering. But there has to be a reason that the death rate is so, so much higher, right? Firstly, Europeans are not just better drivers. That I can tell you from first-hand experience, but the answer really is simple. Here in the United States, you can get almost nowhere without a car. The American system of suburbs allows for people to live far away from their work, but it comes at a major cost. If you can't afford a car gas, you may have to walk upwards of three miles to get to the nearest grocery store. For many, getting to school or work without a car is a downright impossibility. And even if you live close enough to do so, you may have to cross Strodes. Strodes are dangerous combinations of streets and roads that us Americans are intimately familiar with. Cars go fast, oftentimes well over 30 miles an hour, but they are often the only way to get to our destinations. When hit with a car going 20 miles per hour, the average person has a 97% chance of survival. However, once you get to around 45 miles per hour, the survivability drops down to 50%. In Europe and other developed countries, there are more options than just cars. Firstly, the cities are just designed better. In Vienna, the Austrian capital, the entire city is designed with people first, not cars. Instead of bustling streets with sidewalks designated for people to walk in, the entire city is designed to be walked around with ease. Vienna's Stadtentwicklungsplan, or Urban Development Plan, is carefully designed to put people first, not cars. This is all done to make sure people can live the best lives they possibly can. And when you want to go somewhere that's too far for travel by foot, well... Vienna has some of the best public transportation that you can find in the city. Vienna Lenin operates 5 underground lines, 29 tram, and 127 bus lines, of which 24 are night lines. A single ticket costs €2.40. For almost half the price of a Big Mac, you can go anywhere in the city of Vienna, quickly and efficiently. Other cities in Europe also have robust transportation systems, which is the biggest factor in the substantially lower death rates by automobile when compared to the United States. Public transportation is significantly more safe than driving in a car. According to the International Railway Safety Council, railways provide a safe and sustainable form of transport worldwide. Whilst the actual level of safety achieved can vary wildly, even within economically developed areas such as the European Union, railways are typically safer than all other transport modes with the exception of commercial aviation. Not only are high-speed rail and public transportation safer for the people, but they are also substantially safer for the planet. Transportation in the United States accounts for 27% of the country's total greenhouse gas emissions. And, in a study done regarding the high-speed rail track between Los Angeles and San Francisco, the analysis concludes that the carbon footprint of high-speed rail, including operation, track construction, and rolling stock construction, is about 14 to 16 times less than transport by private car or airplane. On top of this, the United States and Canada Two of the G7 countries have substantially higher amounts of carbon emissions when compared to the rest, and this is not just due to the fact that they burn significantly more fossil fuels for power. Germany also burns a significant amount of fossil fuels, but they are planning on going carbon neutral by 2045. But Germany's 8.9 tons per capita is still nearly half of the US and Canada. Electrifying transportation is a requirement if we want to fight climate change, and other countries are doing their part. And before you get started, Electric cars are not the solution. While they do have zero emissions, they still have a massive carbon footprint. The batteries in electric cars are made of rare earth metals such as cobalt. Not only is the carbon footprint of the extraction substantial, but we also just don't have enough of these materials to sustain the current car culture with electric vehicles. Resource extractivism is often ignored in conversations about the climate crisis, particularly in western narratives. Broadly defined, extractivism is an unsustainable and exploitative extraction of resources from an area by a private or public company. Extractivism is inextricably linked to excess resource use and a product of a capitalist system of production and consumption. For the past several decades, global consumption of resources has become exponentially high. The finite nature of these resources required for electrifying road transportation, combined with the oppressive and destructive nature of extraction, make for the argument as to why. Aside from costs, we cannot all buy electric cars and alleviate the crisis. 
We simply do not have enough rare minerals to power all the electric cars around the world. Electrified public transportation will help substantially reduce our carbon emissions, and it has done so for many other countries. In order to avert a potential climate crisis in our near future, it is imperative that we begin construction on high-speed rail and other public transportation throughout the country. However, this does come at a cost. The San Francisco-Los Angeles high-speed rail track is estimated to cost a grand total of $100 billion upon completion. While this is a truly staggering number, the money spent on the rail is not money lost. When China was entering a recession, they worked on high-speed rail, and it provided thousands upon thousands of jobs. The much, much smaller San Francisco-Los Angeles project created thousands of jobs too. In a study conducted by San Jose State University, they found that, under the most conservative high-speed rail spending scenario considered, over the 15-year period evaluated, more than 25,000 full-time equivalent job years are created. This amounts to 14,900 jobs per billion real dollars of spending, or a cost of approximately 67,200 per job year. In China, they plan to have enough high-speed rail to get around a city within one hour, get around a city cluster within two hours, and make a trip between city clusters in three hours. Being the United States' biggest competitor on the global stage, China has for now, thoroughly beat us in the sectors of public transportation. If in only 12 years, China was able to construct this much rail, imagine how much the United States, the richest country in the world, could do. Taking on this challenge would be an expensive one, but as we worked, it would get cheaper. When you are constantly working on a project, you become more efficient over time. America's high-speed rail construction must not stop in California, and instead be built throughout the country. While the cost of rail is staggering, in 50 years time, when it's all been rolled out, people won't remember how much it costed five decades ago. They will only know the convenience of being able to get around the country quickly and with little interference. I know this because the very thing happens in this country here today. The Federal Highway Act was signed by President Eisenhower in 1956, and it costed around a trillion dollars in today's money, yet no one complains about it. The very same is true of Japan's Shinkansen system. On average, 6.81 million people use Tokyo's metro system every day. The metro allows for people to get where they want to be on time every day. The system is excellently run, with safety checks being performed often and the stations being kept clean. On top of all this, the rail system is cheaper than driving a car. While rail prices can be expensive, they are often less so than an automobile. For a 1 month, 3 month, and 6 month unlimited use rail pass in Tokyo, it costs 17,300, 49,310, and 93,420 yen respectively. This converts to roughly 130, 360, and 680 dollars as of April 2023. The Energy Information Administration estimated the average household spending for gasoline in the United States for 2017 to be roughly 1,977 dollars or more than what it would cost to get unlimited use to Tokyo's metro network for one and a half years. With the current crisis in Ukraine, gas prices have increased dramatically, and the average person's need to use the automobile remaining the same due to the lack of public transportation projects and continued development of suburban housing far away from where people work. It is reasonable to assume that the costs have only gone up in the six years since the estimate was made, and this is without even considering the price of buying a car. Japan's metro does not make nearly as much money as cars do here, but that's by design. Japan, Germany, Austria, and most other countries all heavily subsidize their rail, making sure that it is affordable for all its citizens. Privatization is often proposed as a solution to the problem of cost, but this just wouldn't work. As continental Europe invests in high-speed rail, building new lines, Great Britain's railways are a mess. Fares are rising fares. Services are poorer, and there's been a fall in passenger numbers for the first time in two decades. The privatization of British Rail was disastrous. When compared to the rest of Europe, less people could afford to get around, and those who could got poorer service in order for the companies to keep spending low and profits high. In America, public roads are entirely paid for by the government. If all of a sudden the highway you used to get to work required a toll to use, you would only stand to lose. In order to have an efficient public transportation system to not rival, 
but to even begin to compete with the rest of the world, we need to heavily subsidize our public transportation. Now for the big question. How are you going to pay for it? Well, there are two options. One, we could raise taxes. There is a very little chance of this happening in the modern United States. Two, reallocate funds from somewhere else in the federal budget. Well, this is a very controversial opinion to many in the United States, we do have a perfect source of funds, that being the United States military. The US spends a truly staggering amount of money on its military. If we were to allocate $100 billion or more from the military budget to the construction of high-speed rail throughout the country, we could fund multiple projects simultaneously. The California high-speed rail track between Los Angeles and San Francisco is estimated to cost $100 billion total over the course of over a decade. If we allocated $100 billion per year to the development of high-speed rail, we could still outspend China, India, the UK, Russia, France, Germany, and Saudi Arabia combined. The difference in the amount of high-speed rail between the US and other countries is truly staggering. The United States has the highest GDP out of any country on Earth, and yet we don't even have a rail line between LA and Las Vegas yet. Currently, if you wish to travel distances too far for a car, you have to take a plane. However, once again, this is terrible for the climate. Building rail would largely replace these short-range flights. Having a set track for trains to run on is much more efficient than flying a plane such short distances. In countries like Japan or China, you can easily get around by train. The same goes for almost the entire European continent. In the United States, we are decades behind the rest of the world. Of course, it wouldn't make sense to connect every city with high-speed rail. The population density just isn't high enough for that. However, we could instead use a system similar to what we already have with airports. Places like Idaho don't have international airports, but they do have airports that connect to places that do. Instead of having high-speed rail throughout the entire country as some people think people are proposing, places like Boise, the capital of Idaho, could connect to places like Salt Lake City, the capital of Utah, which would then connect to places like Los Angeles, Seattle, etc. This is just one proposed map for the future of high-speed rail in the United States. This country is a laughing stock for the rest of the world. What citizens of every other major country take for granted, we don't even have. It is imperative that the United States invest in high-speed rail to keep up with the rest of the developed world, fight climate change, and increase the quality of life for its citizens. There is so much I could still talk about, but in the interest of keeping this essay somewhat brief, I've left some stuff out. If you're interested in reading more, such as the topic of induced demand, where building more lanes on a freeway actually increases the traffic, or about how 5% of all urban land in the United States is dedicated to parking lots, then you can find stuff like that and some more in the description of this video, including the full paper I wrote on this subject. If you live in the United States and agree that our country needs to develop high-speed rail infrastructure, then what you need to do is really simple. In the next election cycle, vote for the politicians that are public transport friendly.